Welcome, everyone. My name is Christine Trost. I'm the Associate Director of the Institute for the Study of Societal Issues, and I also work closely with Berkeley Center for Right-Wing Studies. I am subbing today for Dr. Lawrence Rosenthal, who is here in the audience, but a little bit under the weather. And so he asked if I could uh, offer some welcoming remarks, uh, and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Polyakova. Um, before we begin, however, I'd like to announce our next event, uh, sponsored by the Berkeley Center for Right Wing Studies. It will be on Wednesday, April 6th, and it will feature Theta Scotchpole, who is the renowned uh, professor of government and sociology at Harvard. She's also the director of the Scholars Strategy Network, and she will be giving a talk entitled The Coke Effect, the impact of a cadre-led network on American politics. It should be very interesting. It will focus on health reform, social policy, and civic engagement amidst the shifting inequalities in American democracy. So that will be Wednesday, April 6th, here in the Woldovsky Conference Room from 4 to 5.30 p.m. Please turn off your cell phones if you haven't already. The format for this event is for Dr. Polyakova to provide about a 45-minute presentation, and then we'll open things up for uh, Q&A with, with you all. So it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Alina Polyakova. She is direct, Deputy Director of the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council in Washington, D.C., and I'm especially delighted to welcome Dr. Polyakova today because we think of her as one of our own, yeah. if that's not too <laughs> forward of me to say. But she, um, she received her PhD uh, from Berkeley here in sociology, and for two years she was one of our fellows here at the Center for Right-Wing Studies, and so we had an opportunity to get to know her and her work, and um, we are so proud of you and all that you've done since then, the amazing dissertation you wrote, and the fact that you're willing to come back and share more with us today. She is the author of the recently published book, which was based on her dissertation, entitled The Dark Side of European Integration. Uh, it examines the rise of far-right parties in Western and Eastern Europe. She has been a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, the Fulbright Foundation, the National Science Foundation, the Social Science Research Council, the International Research and Exchange Board, and also a senior research fellow and lecturer at the University of Bern. Her writings have appeared in academic journals, including the Journal of European Public Policy and also Comparative Politics, and she is the co-author of the Atlantic Council report, Hiding in Plain Sight, Putin's War in Ukraine. She is also a frequent media commentator on developments in Ukraine, Russia, and Europe. Her commentary has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, Foreign Affairs, The American Interest, Newsweek, and Politico. She's originally from Kiev, Ukraine, and speaks Russian and German fluently. The title of her talk today is The Rise of Far-Right Nationalism in Europe and the Russian Angle. Implications for International Security and Foreign Policy. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Polyakova. Wow, so thank you so much, Christine, for that very generous introduction. <laughs> That's maybe the most generous introduction I've had to date. And it is really uh, very much a, a pleasure and honor to be here, uh, particularly because of my time as a fellow at the Institute and the many years, the many years I spent as a graduate student here. So thank you all for coming and uh, listening to my talk. So as Christine mentioned, um, I'm now working very much on foreign policy issues. And so what I've been learning for myself is how to translate the academic research that I've been engaged with into policy. And so that's uh, what I want to walk uh, through with you today um, in a very quick way by making some of the connections that I've seen between how uh, academic work and research can really contribute to policy questions that are really at the, at the center of our current global challenges. So in, in my own research, I've been very interested in the salience of nationalism and globalized societies, particularly in Europe. And why Europe? 
Because Europe has established the largest supranational set of economic and political institutions to date, however, within the supranational context, nationalism both as an identity that people hold and also in its more extremist form of political far-right parties, rather than fading away, has persisted and even surged over time. And while far-right parties in themselves are not new to the European political landscape, their growth has accelerated in recent years, and particularly since the 2008 financial crisis. And given the refugee crisis that's still happening today, we would expect to see even more of a boost in elections um, in the next round for far-right par parties. So the point that I would like to convey today is that the EU's rapid economic and political integration and its coordinated response to crises in particular tends to harden nationalist impulses in Europe. And this turn towards nationalism, and particularly in the form of support for the far right, um, is playing into Russia's political agenda in Europe. So first, I think it's useful for all of us to remember what the European project was and what it wasn't and isn't today. And how that plays into, how that can be juxtaposed with <coughs> ideas of nationalism, national identity. So then I want to connect um, and define nationalism and identity as I use it in this talk um, and translate that into how identity shifts during critical moments, particularly during the financial crisis, uh, which I've examined in some recently published work with my uh, former dissertation advisor here, Berkeley Neil Flickstein. And then I want to switch gears a little bit away from talking about identity, which is of course an individually held attitude um, to talking about the rise of far-right political parties and trying to understand the connection between those two to the extent that we can. And lastly, um, I think it's because I'm coming from the Washington environment, I think it's important to consider how this has any, any policy implications or potential outcomes uh, looking forward in the near and medium term. So the European project. Um, so... Maybe this is, um, I'm speaking to, to the choir here a bit, but I think it's important to remember that the European community was established immediately after World War II as an economic energy union um, centered on coal and steel production. And it was based on the premise that economic integration could be a real path to peace. And on a sort of, I guess, ideological level, um, it was based on this very optimistic idea that Enlightenment ideals would pro push history forward, um, progress towards a Europe whole free and at peace. And I think for the vast majority of its relatively short history, the European project has appeared to deliver on its promises. Uh, through the European community and later the European Union, governments committed themselves to human rights, individual freedoms, but at the same time, the EU very much began acting like a state. Um, it created a common economic zone and later the Schengen Agreement for visa-free travel and it produced a common currency. These are things we all take for granted today, particularly young people living in Europe. And this uh, economic integration was very much followed by political integration. So today the EU, I think, has 30, 13 ex um, legislative and executive bodies that govern all aspects of fiscal policy and national security policy at the EU level. It established the le legislative branch in the European Parliament. It established executive bodies, um, such as the European Commission. And it also established the symbolic ways of state making. Um, there's a capital, there's Brussels. There's a European flag. There's even a European anthem. So in all these ways, the EU engaged in state building and nation building, but it did this at the supranational level. And this process, we have to remember, is very much driven by the political elite. Now, thanks to this rapid economic and political integration, conflict between EU countries is now pretty much unimaginable. Uh, we can't imagine even Germany invading France or Italy or, or Poland. Um, and I think this is an accomplishment that we have to really remember, that on a continent that was so riddled by bloodshed for the first half of the 20th century, the EU has been able to accomplish a lot through these integration processes. So 
how do we how do I define nationalism and national identity for the purposes of this talk? Um, so I very much subscribe to Benedict Anderson's very famous understanding of nationalism as this imagined community of belonging, which can be both inclusive in its civic understanding of nationalism based on political rights, and it can also be exclusive based on ancestral uh, bloodlines, etc. And I think these two are not in opposition to each other, as some literature may suggest. Uh, national identity, however, I think is slightly different. Um, Gellner thought of national identity as a cultural pool in which we can swim in very comfortably. So that's based on language and communication. And it emerges on the basis of institu institutionalization, education and communication, something that Haas and also Deutsch have discussed. So in according to this theory of, of national identity and this understanding of nationalism um, as a sense of culture of belonging, National identity it really emerges on the basis of state building, uh, the introduction of mass education, mass communication. So if we think about the emergence of national identity, a European identity should have emerged from the EU state-like behavior of economic and political institution building. But national identities have remained very much entrenched in European countries. And so one way to understand the entrenchment of national identities versus the emergence of a supranational identity is to examine the sense of belonging in periods of crisis. And again, the European Union is a perfect place to look at for this sort of natural experiment, if you want to think of it that way. It's been hit by two major crises, crises in its recent history. Over the last eight years, there's been the financial crisis that has pushed uh, Southern Europe and also, I guess you can call it sort of the Western flank, very much into recession. Um, it has forced these countries to take on very unpopular austerity politics um, that have been very much, in some ways, uh, pushed down their throats by the core member states, particularly Germany. Um, these dangerous fiscal imbalances were particularly devastating to countries like Greece, Ireland, Spain, and Portugal, Italy, and the Baltic states. So what is happening in Europe? And in terms of identity. How have the Europeans fared through this crisis? So this is a very basic uh, line graph that I'd like to walk you through very quickly. Um, so the basic question that this, I think, I, is, is, a, is a symbol for or an indicator for is to what extent Europeans see themselves as belonging to Europe versus to their own countries. So this is a Eurobarometer data. And Eurobarometer has been, uh, it's a survey that's asked about every six months Started in 1992. It's not uh, panel data, but it's, it's the most comprehensive survey of uh, attitudes and identity issues in the European Union to date. So if you look at this, let me see if I can use. Is this the. The top button. Ah, very good. Okay. So if you look at the top, these, these blue lines, um, these are the percentages of Europeans. I'm sorry, this got cut off. But these, are, these oscillate, so people that associate just with their nationality, which is the lighter blue line at the bottom, so they see themselves only as German, Italian, French, etc. Um, and these are individuals who see themselves as national first, so as German first, and European second. Um, the literature uh, calls these individuals as Europeans light or situational Europeans. So what we see is that we don't see much change since 1992 until 2013, which points to the fact that the majority of Europeans continue, despite various crises and shocks, to see themselves as only belonging first and foremost to their nation states. So now if you look at the European only category, which is this orange line at the very bottom, um, it stayed relatively low. If anything, it's declined. But it's never been higher than 7% of the, of the respondents, which was the very beginning, sort of at the peak um, of the fall of socialism, the reintegration of East Germany, etc. So what this shows is that despite these kinds of institutional, political, and economic integration processes, a European identity has not emerged in Europe. Uh, but this aggregate level, of course, hides how European citizens in different countries have experienced European integration. So to look at that question, 
of how do crises affect European sense of belonging. Um, in a paper that I'm not going to go into the methodological details, but I'm happy to talk about if those of you who are interested in logistic regressions um, at the end uh, in the Q&A. Um, so this is the question we're interested in asking. You know, how do crises affect European sense of belonging? Um, and to do this, our hypothesis was that the economic crisis uh, would affect Europeans' identities uh, very differently. And in particular, we're interested in understanding why do some people uh, turn to their countries, turn to their national identities in moments of crises, and others turn to, to Europe, right? Others become Europeans. So this is the question, are you more likely to be national or European? And that was the dependent variable. And our hypothesis was that in countries where the recession was most severe, citizens would become more nationalist and less likely to see other Europeans and the European Union as a solution to their problems. And in many ways, uh, the findings uh, corroborated this hypothesis. Um, our findings showed that the effects of the economic crisis, um, where they were stronger, and countries that were worse hit in terms of changes in GDP, some countries experienced 12% drops in GDP between 2007 and 2009. That was the year, the two years of the worst of the economic crisis. Um, other countries in, in experienced huge growth in their sovereign debt ratios, um, huge growth in their unemployment. So we tried to capture this, and we looked at Eurobarometer data in 2005 and in 2010. Okay. Uh, just um, if you want to ask questions, I'm not necessarily in the academic model of uh, waiting till the end. So if you have questions, I can answer them. Feel free to interrupt me. Um, so looking at these two cross sections, 2005 and 2010, and trying to capture the effect of the crisis at each national level, what we found was that indeed in countries that were worse hit, individuals were much more likely to see themselves in national terms. And these effects were uh, highly significant and also l proportionally large. So when we looked at GDP, for example, to just to give you one example, um, in some countries, in some of the Baltic states, GDP dropped by upwards of 10% in those two years. And what we found is that for every percent drop in GDP, an individual was more likely to see him or herself in national terms. So 10% GDP drop almost translated into a 10% likelihood of seeing yourself as German, Italian, French, etc. Um, and so what, what the conclusions we reached based on this study uh, was that as European elites push for a coordinated response uh, based on austerity, supervision of banking, and coordination of fiscal policy, the national mood was moving the opposite direction of policy coordination. And so while the EU and EU policy leads were pushing for increasingly coordinated measures, their constituents were becoming more and more alienated from Europe and its politics and looking for solutions elsewhere. So the economic crisis, according to our research, actually produced more nationalism in this sort of soft view of nationalism as identity. The EU was not the solution. There was a certain turn inward and the largest effects were in hardest hit countries. So I think from this we can draw some conclusions about how crises uh, have affected Europe and will affect Europe going forward. So crises in Europe, instead of solidifying Europeans as a, to present a unified joint response to crises, they actually tend to divide Europe. So crises tend to weaken European solidarity as a result of this unpopular, forceful EU-led response, produces an idea of distant, unaccountable elites, and increasing grievances against EU institutions. And, and these findings also reflect in many of the public opinion uh, polling that we've seen come out after the economic crisis by Pew and, and other uh, polling organizations. And crises tend to strengthen nationalists. Um, that advocate and lobby or um, produce the kinds of policy platforms that are, are very much anti-establishment, they blame outsiders, introduce intra-European cleavages, um, and national governments are presented as the solution to grievances that are put forth uh, by the European Union. So based on this study, you know, what can we say 
about uh, far-right politics. Um, what we've seen happening in Europe is a sort of far-right backlash. Um, so in response to crises, um, a culture of black backlash, an alternate narrative has emerged. Um, this is a very interesting uh, picture I found online. These are Jobbik uh, supporters uh, rallying in Hungary. Jobbik is uh, Hungary's far-right party, uh, which is now the second largest, second most popular uh, party in Hungary uh, behind the center-right Fidesz. Um, so the far-right backlash and the far-right narrative is really based on this idea of cultural loss, a cultural loss that is propagated by an elite-led supranational institutions in which national governments no longer have control over their national decisions. And the mainstream parties that have in many ways been responsible for ushering in European integration are now seen as the ones to blame for the very processes that once produced prosperity but now produce disintegration and in some countries mass economic recession. And the far-right narrative, and I'm talking very broadly, of course, far-right parties vary quite significantly in their own platforms. Um, it tends to be isolationist in its economic agenda and in security orientation. And what's interesting, which I will turn to later in the talk, um, is that they have a pro-Russian orientation that is relatively new. So just to give you um, a very quick overview of how the economic crisis, at least, has accelerated the growing support for far-right parties. And I looked at this question um, more um, rigorously and methodologically, but I don't want to go into the details of that right now. So this also presents to you a very uh, simple chart. And this chart looks at all of the far-right parties in, that are active in Europe today. Um, and I would just preface this by saying just because they're grouped on the same chart doesn't mean that the Golden Dawn, which is the, the Greek pseudo-neo-fascist party, is the same as the National Front. There's mass variation within these groups. So for each national context, these are the most far-right extremist groups in that particular country. Um, so this is just a chart showing the results from the most recent parliamentary election, which for most countries is 2014-2015, um, and that's in this first um, column here. And then the last parliamentary election before the financial crisis. In most countries, there were two elections between 2005 and 2016. So this is um, not the most, re this is two steps back from the most recent, if that makes sense. So what we see is um, pretty interesting. We see, of course, the massive growth in support for Yobek from 2%, and I think this was in, I remember saying 2006, um, to 20% um, supporting Yobik today. Um, and we see interesting patterns also in traditionally social democratic countries like Finland, Sweden, Denmark, the Netherlands. Uh, and the National Front, this is first round uh, voting for the National Front, which tends to be, in France, is a strange two-round system, as many of you might know. Um, so the first round elections tend to be more representative of the national uh, political um, uh, mood. And what's interesting is, of course, these two bottom parties um, in Poland and Romania, the Greater Romania Party, just completely losing steam and becoming uh, pretty much irrelevant today. Um, and in Poland, uh, the self-defense of the Re Republic of Poland, the SRP, um, also becoming quite irrelevant. Um, I can talk about those cases, and in fact, um, the little policy brief that I handed out at the beginning um, looks at, for, for this reason, looks at Jobbik uh, versus Romania. So why this mass failure in Romania um, and this success for the far right electorally um, in Hungary? And I can talk about that a bit more, um, but in the interest of time, I won't. So I think the takeaway from this table is that what we've seen as a response to the economic crisis in many ways has been a surge in far-right nationalist parties. And I would bet at least $100 that the next electoral cycle is going to see uh, many more jumps across the board in Europe. Uh, in, in Italy, for example, the Liga Nord, which only received 4% last parliamentary elections, is not polling at almost 20%. 
So these are significant changes that we're going to see in Europe in, in the near term. So crises, while accelerating growing support for far-right parties, whose overarching narrative of EU resentment, anti-immigrant sentiment, law and order, and a return to true Europeanness, address the demands of voters which the mainstream has so far ignored. Um, but this mainstream ignorance or uh, detente against the far right is also changing. And while these groups have a long history in most European countries, it's really only recently, as I said previously, that they have become um, a challenge to the mainstream uh, center-right parties and have also developed a very clear pro-Putinist, not even a pro-Russian, but a very clear pro-Putinist stance. Mm -hmm. Yep. Before you go on from this slide, I'm just kind of curious why you characterize this as a surge, because about half the countries yeah. you know, have a decrease. So Yeah, and, and some of these countries are interesting. There, there are interesting reasons for this. So, um, like in Ataka, for example, if we go through, like it starts to decline here, right? Um, so Italy, this chart, I think, is not actually representative, as I said, of what we're going to expect to see very soon. Mm. Um, I have to check, but I think the Italian results are relatively old, meaning I think they're 2012, 2013 last elections. Um, and now the Northern, the Northern League is polling at 17 or 18%. Um, so this is already bef this is before the refugee crisis in most of these cri in most of these countries. Um, if you want to get more specific about oh, the Slovak National Party is another one to watch. Um, this number is probably going to increase quite significantly. Um, so in Greater Romania, the Greater Romania Party, and also in Poland, these are interesting cases because they've seen the largest declines. Um, I could talk very briefly about that, if that's of interest. Well, also I'm wondering what about Spain? Spain's not on yes. there. Spain was really hard hit by the financial crisis, so... Well, the, the, the Spanish, um, uh, I guess you say, response has been on the far left. So that's what this leaves out. That's a very good point. So I've been always interested in the far right, mm -hmm. but this doesn't mean that the far left has also not benefited in some countries. Mm -hmm. um, and that's actually a topic to explore. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Germany, for example, is not on here either. Uh, well, it's on here, the NDP. But the NDP is completely irrelevant. Um, it's this neo-Nazi neo party that has never received very, uh, like any support in, the, in Germany's entire history. But the new German, um, uh, you could say far-right populist party called the AFD, the Alternative for Deutschland, is now polling higher than the Greens for the first time. And we will very likely enter parliament. So I think you're right. What we've seen is actually a response on both flanks. The far-right response has been much more noticeable um, and also much more consistent than, than the far-left. Um, but yes. Yep. And how do you account for the Polish results? Because ah, Poland. The Polish, you know, uh, the left and right-wing party is ascendant. Well, that's, that so that's exactly right. That's, that, this is a question of how mainstream parties are respond, mainstream right parties have responded to the far right. So what we've seen in Poland, and also it's interesting, the Polish-Hungarian uh, uh, counter, counter example. So what we've seen in Poland is a complete siphoning of the far right vote by what is now the mainstream right party in power. So what they have managed to do is, uh, I guess, mobilize the grievances that the far right was mobilizing at a time in Poland, but not very successfully because they didn't have the capacity or the organizational mobilization abilities. Um, and in the narrative that you see coming from the PIS now, it is very much a populist nationalist narrative. Um, so in many ways, the, the Polish response of, by the center right has been to co-opt the narrative of the far right. And it has been effective in taking out the extremists. Now in Hungary, this hasn't worked. We don't know yet. Though. Well, it hasn't worked so far. Um, right now, um, Orban's government uh, which is still technically center-right, is moving further and further to the extremes of the far-right. And what we've seen is examples of um, Fidesz, which is uh, Orban's party, uh, taking up some of the policy agendas of the far-right and almost using them as, as a test case to see if they get any traction. And I think the strategy is the same, right? What, what can the mainstream party do? There's a few responses, right? There's a response of non-cooperation, 
or there's a response of co-optation of the agenda. We can probably think of a few more in between those extremes. And Orban, in many ways, has been, and Fidesz has been co-opting some of Jobbik's agenda. But well, instead of seeing a complete demise of Jobbik, which is what we saw in Poland uh, with the far right, it's actually just gaining more and more traction. Yeah. So, Alina, uh, on the, basically, how you count the question, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, in my view, Fidesz, PIS, and National Front are all pretty close in their actual uh, agenda. And so, you know, you have uh, the National Front as listed as, you know, far right, but, you know, I'm from a sort of pro programmatic perspective. Are they, I mean, Fidesz is at least as far right. Uh, and, uh, and PIS is, you know, in large measure tracking it seems to be tracking, you know, Fidesz. So, uh, it, it, is it if you have a uh, a right party flanking you that matters? Is that what can, that's how you score something? Yeah. Uh, even if they're way right. It's for each national context. That's exactly right. But I think what you're pointing to is also this interesting phenomenon where, because of growing support for the far right, which was so marginal in Europe um, in, in the 1990s and even the early 2000s. We've seen a shift of the entire political landscape to the right in each country to various degrees. Um, and I think even in France, um, I'm not saying that Sarkozy speaks for his party, but if we've heard, um, if you listen to some of the statements that he has made, um, you do see a much um, sort of a murkiness between Le Pen, especially as Le Pen's party has moved further to the center and has ousted um, her father as a sort of the symbol of uh, breaking with the past. So what we've seen is Le Pen and also Jobbik actually moving more to the center while the center moves more to the right. And what that's producing is a movement in the political landscape across all these countries, but again, to varying degrees. Yes, to show us the example of the most recent parliamentary elections, but for example, in France, uh, in the re recent municipal regional ones or European ones, the National Front is very high, it's 25 or 70 right. percent, which is very, well, it's very frightening for, for the people. And you're right, uh, there is a, a, a shift uh, from the regular right to the, in the narrative to the, the, the far right. And uh, yeah. maybe uh, explain some of the low results in other countries uh, with a narrative, a far right narrative, which is integrated. Uh, yeah, I think it's a little too early to tell in some ways because the refugee crisis is shifting these political dynamics very significantly now. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in the next national parliamentary elections. Um, but what we have seen so far is exactly uh, these varying strategies that the center right has uh, deployed as a response to their far right parties, um, either by ignoring them, which hasn't seemed to work in some places or by co-opting their political agenda. And yes, you're right, the municipal elections in France, those are very interesting, because there's a very good chance that the National Front was going to take um, six out of the 12, I think, municipal uh, municipalities in France. Um, and what it took to prevent that from happening is, of course, the, the left, the center left and the center right uh, colluding, essentially, uh, to prevent the National Front from taking those seats. And in the end, I, don't, I think they only got one Region. Well, they didn't. They didn't get the one. The, 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 the left side wanted to. Right. to, to, to uh, they took out the their candidates. The, yeah. The regular right, we, uh, we, we didn't want to, to, to make, a, to make a, an agreement with the left to, yep. to speak to the people and say, we are as right as we You know, in, because France has this interesting, you know, two, two cycle, two round system in the parliamentary election that also tends to cut out um, some of the smaller parties in the second round. I think the presidential elections in France are going to be very interesting because uh, I don't think we can rule out uh, Marine Le Pen from those. Um, but we'll see. Are there any more questions about the table? Thank yes. You. Thank you. What you've said so far reminds me of U.S. history in two aspects. There was a very local identity in the early U.S. history, the Confederacy, uh, the original Confederate states, I mean, not, not the South, but they mm -hmm. couldn't hold together because they had such local interests and so on. They had to write a new constitution. 
but there was always this, it took about a century for the United States to really establish, in my opinion, a national identity. Even after the Civil War, there was an increased regional identity. It was about four main parts that are remember New England, Midwest, in different parts. They had very, very local identities. This is, seems to me part of a nation building process, thinking of the European Union as a nation. And uh, however, the EU exists in the 21st century now, so there are things about the 21st century that will bring these national groups together and the supernatural groups, such as work in different places, traveling to different places, of various rituals like football and other things that happen in right. and European. So th there seems to me a dynamic like this that we can look at in terms of the US example and see if it's applicable to the European example, except mm -hmm. for in the United States they have a lot of land and they welcome immigrants, whereas in Europe they don't. They're filled up and so that, that might be a big factor. Let's can, thank you for that excellent comment. Maybe we can save sure. the discussion of that yeah. for later. Let you get through your talk, sure. and then we can come back idea. for more yeah. more discussion. Okay, very good. Um, I'd like to come back to that. Um, but I only have uh, a few more slides, so we're almost okay. through this. It's interesting. I've given this talk before, and this 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 table, which I thought was very simple, always uh, produces a lot of discussion. <laughs> um, maybe I should get rid of it. <laughs> um, so, um, okay, so now to turn to this last uh, point that I, I was making regarding the pro-Putinist turn in, in some of these parties' foreign policy. Um, this has been very interesting to observe. Um, my, when I was writing my dissertation, which I finished in 2013, this was, this was not part of it. So in many ways, it's a relatively new phenomenon, not in the sense of no, the Soviet Union, of course, has a long history of supporting, uh, in, in that time, far-left extremist destabilizing political groups in Europe. So in many ways, the Kremlin's uh, current uh, strategy is nothing new. But what is new is how public and explicit it is. So what we've seen is that under President Putin specifically, um, since his last uh, term in 2012 began, Russia has developed increasingly more public links with the European far right. And far-right leaders, for therefore, have consistently expressed their admiration, particularly for Mr. Putin in public comments. So Nigel Farage, for example, who is uh, the head of uh, the leader of UKIP um, in, in England, has said that he admires Vladimir Putin the most. I mean, this gets a little bit ridiculous. Um, Marine Le Pen has consistently said um, that anti-Russian uh, policies like sanctions are not useful for... Um, the EU-Russia relationship and that uh, the EU should seek to cooperate and have diplomatic relations with Russia. Um, there's also been evidence of Russian financing of Le Pen specifically. This is the most uh, clear example. Uh, the National Front um, has received uh, 9.4 euros from a Russian-owned bank uh, based in the Czech Republic, I believe. And there's a lot of circumstantial evidence, but not as clear as this particular transfer of fin financial funds. Um, but circumstantial evidence suggesting that Jobbik and Ataka, which is the Bulgarian far-right party, um, have also received financial support from, from Russia. But I think what's become very vivid and very clear and very public is the network building that has happened uh, between um, the Kremlin, uh, Mr. Putin, United Russia, and these far-right groups. So far politicians consistently participate in conferences in Russia where they are very well received, better than they are in their own countries in many ways. And they, they have participated as election observers in elections and referenda that are not recognized by any international institution or um, national <laughs> government. And what I'm referring to here is, of course, the refer referendum for the annexation of Crimea um, in the March of 2014. Uh, which had election observers from European political parties. And if you looked at who they were, they were all members of these far-right political groups. Um, and then the same thing happened um, in the Donbass in Ukraine um, in May of 2014, uh, when there was an uh, election held by, in the occupied territories of the LNR and DNR. And again, uh, many far-right members were there to legitimize those election results. So 
Success in supporting these national movements within Europe um, can result in empowering groups that are friendly to Russia. Um, even while unsuccessful nationalist groups erode the unity and confidence in EU institutions. So I don't want to uh, overstate the relevance of this uh, because it's something, um, a line of research that I'm pursuing now. Um, because tracking you know, how Russia actually supports fire groups and to what extent and to what these fire groups actually get out of their public support uh, for Russian foreign policy is, is difficult because we don't have the evidence um, or clear based evidence. But what we do know is that these parties tend to be incredibly well represented in EU institutions. So in the European, European Parliament in 2014, it's an irony that anti-EU parties um, have gained so many seats in the European Parliament, often coming in first in many, for many of their national elections. And as members of the European Parliament, they consistently vote uh, with a, in a, for pro-Russian policies. So against sanctions, against other economic restrictions um, that the European Union and the US has been coordinating on. And what I think is really happening in Europe today with these machinations, a turn to the right, and now this new element of a very odd um, love affair between the far right and Mr. Putin specifically um, is, is a new reality um, in Europe. This tends to very much benefit um, Russia. Um, so this new European reality in which pro-Russian anti-EU parties do not fade away, but rather gain momentum, particularly moments of crisis, plays directly into Russia's hands and in its method of uh, influence in which uh, political influence is just one part, but also includes economic influence to the energy market. If any of you follow the Nord Stream 2 uh, debacle recently, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, and uh, information war that has been very much waged in Europe. And we saw this very, very clearly uh, during the Ukraine crisis and also um, with the ongoing uh, Russian intervention in Syria. So what does this all mean? I think there are some potential outcomes that we can see from some of these trends that I've described. Um, I think Europe is going to change. Um, I don't think we're going to see Europe uh, progress in the ways that it has um, with the acceleration of uh, economic and political integration. Uh, we're likely to see some sort of bifurcation of Europe, perhaps between the core and the periphery countries. What that configuration will look like, I'm not sure, but we could see a sort of tiered approach where some countries uh, join the Eurozone and some do not, or leave the Eurozone, but still participate in Schengen, for example. I think we're already witnessing a very weakened transatlantic alliance, uh, which will lead to difficulties in addressing common emerging global threats. Uh, one example of this, of course, has been the very well orchestrated sanctions policy against Russia for its uh, annexation of Crimea and involvement in eastern Ukraine, uh, which the U.S. and the EU um, have followed each other on this policy. Um, those sanctions have been recently renewed, but this summer I think is going to bring a lot about a lot of questions about renewals of those sanctions again. Um, and there's going, to, there's going to be a hardening of nationalist impulses in response to crises, particularly in the most vulnerable states. And even though before I never thought that Eastern Europe would be a, a quote-unquote weak link in the European Union, I think the potential is there now. Because if we look back um, prior to 2008, for example, um, far-right parties were much stronger in Western Europe. Eastern Europe, um, at least the EU member states, didn't really have uh, substantially influential far-right parties across the board. Um, so your big success um, is a potential uh, precedent, a route for other far-right parties to follow in the region. And Central Eastern European countries are now feeling the brunt of the refugee crisis in, in very profound ways. And these are countries that don't have the institutions um, or the cultural foundations to really integrate immigrant flows. So if I had to uh, give this talk to policymakers, um, some of the recommendations that I could see arising from this and for, for the U.S., um, if I was um, in the administration, the White House, or even in the Pentagon, um, I would want to strengthen our bilateral diplomatic ties within Europe. So with Germany, with France, uh, with Italy, 
um, as a way to um, compete with Russia's similar strategy of establishing bilateral relationships with these countries. Uh, I think we should support and strengthen Europe's ability to address crises, particularly now with the refugee crisis, with financial resources and also diplomatic resources. And I think we need to reinvest our diplomatic and military resources in Europe's most vulnerable nations, particularly in Eastern Europe. And we've seen this happening a little bit. There was a decision a few weeks ago by the Obama administration to quadruple our uh, military investment into Eastern Europe uh, to protect the, the eastern flank. That in multiple studies, one recently released at the end of January by uh, the RAND Corporation, uh, that showed the mass vulnerabilities of the Baltic states. Um, it showed that uh, at, at current levels, I think Russia could be in Tallinn um, in 60 hours, and then they would be met with essentially no resistance. Um, and I think uh, as um, has been already uh, aired by Congress and also by the National um, Intelligence Council, it's important to expose and understand how Russia's toolkit of influence works that goes beyond direct military intervention. So I leave you with that. Thank you. between European identity and national identity that seems to be the, uh, the, the, the thing that your analysis run, runs on. There's a, a third dimension of that that's gone on in Europe, which is regionalism, which is countries breaking up. Or some of these, these very parties, like the uh, Lega Nord, represent uh, points of view that want to separate, in the case of Reagan word, from Italy. And, and you have regional parties in, in a wide variety. You had, you had uh, uh, Britain up there, there there's, there's the Scottish, there's the Scottish and Welsh, you know, Ukraine, <laughs> um, you know, uh, Spain, um, a thing called Czechoslovakia no longer exists and so forth. So um, I'm curious if you have thought about what the relationship of these kind of regional centripetal forces are in, in the context of your analysis. I have. Um, there's not very good data on this, unfortunately. Um, in my anecdotal questioning of my European friends, um, <laughs> I've asked them, you know, if you're faced with a question, uh, just like the Eurobarometer question, in the future do you see yourself as European, German, or Bavarian? Actually, many of them said Bavarian first, then European. Mm -hmm. So the, the German identity wasn't even there in some, in some cases. But these are, of course, you know, take that with a grain of salt. These are people who are, you know, relatively high educational level, um, SES, etc. Um, but this question of regionalism is very difficult to capture, but I think... Um, in a common sense view, if we just see what's happening across Europe, I think you're absolutely right. Well, we've seen a devolution of identity, mm -hmm. not just to the national level, but also to the regional level in many countries. Uh, I think it's difficult to capture that. Um, but I think what it indicates, if we take that as a given, sort of just go with it, um, is that people feel very disconnected from this giant, you know, elite-driven body above them. And they're looking more and more at their local, local communities that are even more localized than their national governments. And what, what that really means for the future of Europe, I don't think it means anything good <laughs> for the European Union specifically. Um, I think it will be up to the national governments to try to manage those secessionists. I mean, there's um, an interesting uh, dynamic happening in Spain right now uh, with the new injection of, of the left in, in Spain's parliament. Um, I think there's a vote coming up on... Uh, one of the many votes, but this might be, this one might actually happen in secession for Catalonia. In the 90s, the, the Lega Nord talked about its relationship to other regional categories yeah. and, and, uh, and talked about reconstructing the European uh, project by region. So mm. it, wasn't, it wasn't necessarily getting out of Europe, but 
reconstituting, reconstituting the constituents, as it were, of Europe. The slogan was a Europe of regions. Europe yeah, of that's very interesting. I think that that rhetoric, um, I don't see it anymore. Yeah, it, it, it may be. It may be it's bad. really shifted to this anti-EU uh, perspective, which is very popular. Maybe separatist groups <laughs> court. Do you have a question? Yeah, I wanted to talk about the policy recommendations. Yeah. So outside of the quadrupling of the eastern flank, can you speak up a little bit? Specifically, the point that you're making um, regarding supporting the countries that are bearing the brunt of mm -hmm. the refugee influx. How much appetite do you see from your kind of perspective of living and working in Washington for the United States to jump in and support European countries? Financially, yeah, not much. Um, I mean, this varies based on who you're talking to, obviously, and where in, in the government they are. Um, but I think there's a, at least currently there's a general view that, of course, uh, foreign policy follows the administration that the U.S. should not get involved in increasing conflicts and increasing crises. That um, I think our President Obama very much sees his role. Um, in taking the U.S. out of crises. Mm -hmm. And this, is, this has been consistent in Ukraine, it's been consistent in Syria in many ways. Um, so I don't see that changing. Um, we can speculate about who the next president will be, but um, that's another year away. But I don't see much of that happening. You had a question. Yeah, I have a question about the Russia-European far-right axis. Yeah. And it has to do with the historical memories that both sides, that you would expect both sides to yeah. agree to. Putin's Russia has been adamant in opposing various efforts to revise the post-Second World War history, right? Um, in the wake of the devolution of the Soviet Union at the, at the end of the Cold War. But the European far right has a completely different ge historical genealogy in terms of its relationship to the Third Reich experience. Yeah. So how do you see how do you see the European far right with one set of historical mythologies about where it came from, what it stands for, and Russia being adamantly opposed yeah. to various efforts to rehabilitate the Third Reich, including in the Ukraine? Oh. How, I mean, how um, this is a fascinating aspect of the many contradictions and oppositions within. <laughs> um, uh, Kremlin's foreign policy, particularly uh, the narrative it sets forth through the, through the media. So of course, what we saw happening, Ukraine's an excellent example of this, because what was happening in Ukraine was when the uh, Maidan protests began, they were very much framed by, by the Russian media as this neo-fascist coup against the government, right? And Russia's role in this was to be the anti-fascist hero to save Ukraine, save the Russians and the, the ethnic Russians and the Russian speakers of Ukraine, so this is why uh, the annexation of Crimea and the military intervention in the Donbass was justified, because it was an anti-fascist movement, anti-fascist fight. But then on the other hand, you have this merger and a thickening and deepening of network connections between what are ostensibly neo-fascist parties, ostensibly, and the Kremlin. So the mainstream, the government of Russia is building these kinds of relationships very actively. Um, you know, this is very interesting, and how are those two completely contradictory ideas being reconciled? I don't think they are, to be honest with you. And I think these parties, if you look at, I don't know, you probably so read some of the Russian media. historical differences, basically? You know, I think there's been a few things happening. On the one hand, the far right has very much distanced itself, or tried to distance itself from that kind of neo-fascist legacy. And what we saw, actually, if you look at the broader historical view, studying... Um, at the end of World War II, there weren't any far-right parties in Europe. There were some of these kind of neo or fascist, actually, um, elements left, but they weren't organizing uh, for obvious reasons. There wasn't the political environment for that in the 1950s, 1960s. So we actually didn't see the emergence of any far-right groups in any substantial way until the 80s. Uh, like, the Freedom Party in Austria was founded in the 50s, but it didn't become active until much later. And there main goal was to distance themselves from that legacy as much as possible. Some were more successful than others. Um, I think for Le Pen's party, for the National Front, this really only happened very clearly recently with the ousting of her father um, and the very, you know, the symbolic move. So 
that has happened on the, on the side of Europe is this distancing and a, re a real cut between the old right and the new right, uh, where these parties no longer see themselves as the carriers of the historical legacy, very much oppose the historical legacy, actually, in their uh, public rhetoric. Um, and I think, on the other hand, you know, the question, uh, what do these parties get out of supporting Putin, besides money, ostensibly, right? Um, I think they get a particular vision of what national sovereignty looks like um, that is not encroached upon by supranational organization. Um, and this is very much what Mr. Putin represents. If he represents a strong national leader who pursues policies, um, foreign and domestic, in the interests of his own people, and that is what people like Le Pen and uh, others want to do uh, for, the, for themselves. Now, let's forget the fact that there's also all these illiberal tendencies, pro-authoritarian tendencies within Russia, of course. Uh, but we're not going to talk about that. Um, and so on the Russian side, uh, besides its very instrumen instrumental reason uh, for investing in building relationships with these groups in the hopes that they will support a pro-Russian agenda um, in their voting, in their national politics, in the European politics, um, I think what Russia also gets out of it is a certain uh, legitimization of its own policy. So we can, they can take European politicians. Le Pen, for example, was a complete unknown in Russia uh, prior to the annexation of Crimea, which she, she publicly supported. And then all of a sudden, she's you know, the, the French politician who supports Mr. Putin, and her face is all over Russian media. And this shows the Russian people that, look, Europeans support um, our foreign policy. So there's an interesting dynamics happening here. Um, but how, how are they being reconciled? I mean, what makes sense about Kremlin's uh, message? I don't know. Sometimes it doesn't make sense, but it works. <laughs> Okay, back there, and then Charles next. Uh, my question on the same line. How does Putin sell this in Russia? Because basically, Jovic is very anti-Soviet and denies everything uh, the Soviet Union Second World War role. I mean, they, they are supporting practically the, uh, the Hungarian army, which invaded the Soviet Union during World War II. I mean, they, the heroes of Jovic are those. And the second question is that, uh, relating to that, that Yubik uh, specifically helps to destabilize the Ukraine since they have territorial um, uh, demands on Zakarpatia. Is that plays into Putin's uh, policies since he, he has a very specific view of the Ukraine? <sighs> Hungary um, always comes back to haunt me, I suppose. It might haunt all of us for many years to come. Um, Jobbik is an interesting example. You're right. Jobbik was very uh, anti-communist, anti-Soviet, um, and, and anti-Russian for a long time. Interestingly, I said there's only circumstantial evidence uh, for potential financing by these organization, uh, of these organizations by, by Russia. Um, Jobbik was completely irrelevant until um, you know, 2010 or so, um, when it suddenly had a surge. And that very much coincided uh, with Gabor Vanaz's takeover of the Yobik's leadership and also his pro-Russianist rhetoric. It shifted very dramatically in those years. Um, does that mean that it was sort of a quid pro quo relationship? You know, he got some money from Mr. Putin and then all of a sudden um, he's an admirer? We can't say. Um, but there is a correlation there between the rise of Yobik and its shift towards a pro-Putinist uh, pro rhetoric. Um, and about Ukraine, you know, I'm not sure um, how Yobig destabilizes Ukraine. Well, just the demand on Zakarpatia, because they, the they, claims. they would like to claim oh, the claim on Zakarpatia. You know, a lot, a greater Romania party, party also wanted to claim large portions of um, of Moldova, et cetera. Um, I'm not sure that's a significant element at this point, but um, you know, the, the other interesting about Hungary, of course, is that Orban is very much seen as a partner of Mr. Putin as well. So this is what I, uh, when I'm talking about this kind of merge of the far right and the mainstream right, Hungary is an excellent example of that. Um, because not only has Orban adopted some of the rhetoric, the illiberal rhetoric of the far right, uh, he's also very much adopted the pro-Putinist stance of the far right. And, the, and there's evidence for that, um, I think, in very public uh, meetings 
Putin was just uh, very well received by Orban, despite the sanctions against Russia and Hungary very recently, I think within the last two weeks. Um, it's a very interesting paper. Um, one of the themes that you're looking at is sort of the pre pre-crash, post-crash uh, contrast. And inherent within that is a, a an implication that if the economy was better, it would uh, the, the right wing would sort of yeah. fade fade out. But one of the issues that that seems most European nations confront is a, a demographic issue that the, the age pyramids are, are the very old people at the same time comparatively speaking Europe versus the United States uh, the US is getting refreshed by by immigration in Europe the immigration is from Syria and, and other countries in crisis and yet the people there, there seems to be a demographic component to uh, to the argument that you're um, would be worth investigating because the immigration mm -hmm. providing labor which would be important in the revitalization of Europe uh, I don't think has been addressed and I think that, that uh, the way that that plays out in various countries could be very important. That's very interesting because I saw um, a recent study by The Economist, I think, that looked at um, exactly this demographic, demographic question. So forecasting which countries are most likely to decline in their population. So as a result, they need the most influx of new labor. Guess which country was number one that could benefit from that? Hungary. <laughs> Hungary was number one. Yeah. Because because of out migration, also because of declining demographics, etc. Um, but this is, um, I think, what's interesting is that in many ways, um, the economic effects um, don't correspond to the cultural narratives and the cultural appeal that these parties tend to receive, and then they're very successfully framed around the immigration issue specifically. Uh, because if we look at economics, and yes, many of these countries could actually benefit significantly from influx of immigrants, right? Their labor markets are going to come under increasing stress. Um, their welfare systems are already under stress. So what they really need is workers, right? right. Um, to pay their taxes and contribute to uh, the social welfare state. But, of course, this is not how the immigration problem is framed. And this happens in the U.S. too, right? Immigrants are not seen as a source of economic prosperity, even though they often are. Um, they're seen as a source of economic drain. Um, they're scapegoats in many ways for unemployment, declining economic situations, etc. Even if that in no way uh, bears out in reality. And it's, it's interesting. The economic question is very interesting because a lot of it is just about framing these issues. Um, in some other work, I've actually looked at this question of, uh, before the crisis, how economic downturns and economic cycles, um, if they actually lead um, to a rise in the electoral support for the far right in national elections. Um, and actually, in, in that research, I found that neither immigration inflows um, or changes in the economy in very basic measures like GDP, unemployment, debt ratios, uh, they did not significantly contribute to the rise and fall of the far right. I mean, it's, it's a difficult thing to capture, um, but that didn't bear out at all. Um, so the relationship between the economy and the rise of the far right, even though we would think in a very common sense way it should matter, it's unclear what that relationship actually is. Yeah, another way to view these problems, I think, is to look at it in terms of lack of political leadership in Europe, particularly, you know, Merkel and Hollande, and the other, as well as the EU. What happened during the crash? You know, Germany went, and, you know, and insisted on austerity and created all these problems in so many of these countries. What happened with uh, immigration? Again, there was a lack of leadership there. There was a lot of lack of policy responses. It was a passive response at best, instead of proactive response. They had years to do it. They didn't put the money into the Middle East until now. Why? They waited years and years to do the obvious, which is put the money into Turkey, put the, the right. money into those countries. So 
as a result, I think you have a lot of these, these problems. I, w- I would also add to that, um, and I think a lot of it not only has to do with lack of leadership in the European Union, um, but also lack of American leadership. Because in many ways, the, um, the success of the EU rested upon the transatlantic alliance, and the U.S. taking a very active role in seeing the prosperity of the European countries, and also the integration of uh, the post-socialist countries after the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, you know, the Marshall Plan, obviously, after the war, um, huge support for uh, democratic uh, democracy promotion, economic support of Central Eastern European countries. And there has been a mass disinvestment, mass disinvestment. Um, and we see it playing out and also um, in the academy as well. Um, f- there are fewer and fewer opportunities for those of us in social sciences studying the region to actually be funded for our research. And what has that produced? A lack of expertise in the region. Right? Just like it has produced a lack of engagement. Um, these are all um, you know, mutually reinforcing processes. I think that's starting to shift, actually, from what I see happening in Washington now, at least on the defense and military question, that's starting to shift. And usually um, others will follow what the defense and military industrial complex does. Just a quick question to the point of clarification. I, I thought your main argument was that economic crises contribute to this. And then what you said just a second ago is if you look prior to 2008, yes. it doesn't. So what is the argument and why does it change? So what's interesting is um, if we look at national identity, so not voting uh, patterns, it does matter, right? So the, the research I was showing earlier, there are significant effects in the hardest of countries and how people view themselves at the individual level. Now making that connection between uh, country-level voting and contextual economic effects is very difficult. So what I found in that study was that there was no clear relationship. Um, is that, in many ways, a product of the fact that it's difficult to capture because parliamentary elections um, are, happen on five, six-year cycles, and there's lots of things the economy does in between. Can you really make a direct um, argument? Um, it doesn't pan out in statistical analysis. But what I think is important here is not, like I said, not so much about the reality of how the economy or economic crisis affects um, electoral support, um, because that line is difficult to draw directly, the causal line, but how that economic crisis or refugee crisis is framed, right? Um, And how those narratives around economic crisis capture the, the hearts and minds and eventually the votes of European citizens. And I think that's actually what's driving this support. Non, so the framing of the crisis, not necessarily the crisis itself, if that makes sense. Okay, um, Troy. Yeah, I have a question about the euro barometer. Yeah. Uh, about 12 years ago, I attended a conference in Belgium, about eight or 10 nations, and the concern with the, the euro barometer then being used was to, uh, attempt to assess the level of xenophobia in various countries, and there were some surprises. I would have thought that France and Britain would have a high level because those countries had the highest level of immigrants right. or, or people who work in the other. But it turned out that um, it, one of the surprises was the local country that was hosting the conference, which was Belgium, had the highest level of xenophobia in Europe 12 years ago. But here's my question. Have you found the Eurobarometer with respect to this last period and have there been hmm. shifts based upon what we've, dis- we've been talking about the last 24 months of the immigration crisis? You know, I'll have to look at that again, because I haven't looked at a specific question uh, measuring anti-immigrant attitudes. Um, well, that's very interesting. I think, I don't know the answer to that. I have to look at the data again. Um, you know, but we do know that actual immigrant inflows into a country do not necessarily correspond to people's xenophobic anti-immigrant attitudes. Austria, for example, has, uh, last time I checked, had very high anti-immigrant attitudes. It wasn't the Eurobarometer, I think it was a, a Pew survey, I can't remember which survey it was. And they have one of the lowest, that, prior to the refugee crisis, they have one of the lowest uh, number of incoming immigrants. So again, it's about framing, right? It's not about the reality on the ground in many ways. Um, also in the study that I mentioned about the effect of the economy and voting or voting patterns, um, I looked at immigration inflows as well. 
no, no, no significant effects there. And I think what that also shows is that what we would want to do, and I've thought about this, but it's impossible to do in some ways, I don't have the time, is to look at the local context within each country, because the national level doesn't tell you anything, really. Um, you know, you want to break it down to the district level and look at individual communities, immigrant inflows into those I know, municipi municipalities, and then voting patterns at the district level, right? And that's how you would really answer that question um, of the relationship between immigrant inflows, xenophobic attitudes of voting for the far right. Um, but I haven't seen that study yet. <laughs> yes. Being from Eastern Europe, I know some of the history. Uh, there is another aspect that is important nowadays, which is immigration uh, from Syria and, and the Middle East. The European countries, by and large, are very homogeneous, especially Eastern Europe. And there is uh, a, a very strong nationalistic feeling. But on top of that, they are almost uniformly religious, especially Poland. Mm -hmm. And the, the Muslim invasion raised a tremendous amount of resentment because uh, it's different religion, totally different uh, cultural and uh, beliefs. And you can look at Germany, where the Turks immigrated in tens of thousands in the 70s, mm -hmm. and they live in ghettos. And the Muslims don't want to integrate. They live in ghettos, and eventually they multiply much faster than uh, the non-Muslims, except the Orthodox Jews. And uh, they will take political power. But uh, in Poland and Hungary, very Catholic, and the Catholic Church is openly against allowing any of the Muslims. And, and as the, 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 the labor shortage, most of these people are uneducated, not only that they don't speak the language, but they're uneducated, and they will not be entering the labor force. Only maybe their grandchildren, 20, 40 years from now. So there are a number of problems, and especially Eastern Europe, they will uh, fight Germany as much as they can. And why they uh, have a relationship with Putin, it's not because of uh, the money, but the society, the government structure is their ideal. Orban said that two years ago that he, his examples are Erdogan yeah. and Putin. And because the, the system of government, that's his, to his liking. Right. Yeah, this idea of building a liberal state is um, something that Orban likes to say. Um, you know, I was, I'll make one comment about this. Um, Germany's an interesting example because of the uh, Turkish guest worker program. Many of them remain in, in Germany, of course, and in many ways still live in very um, uh, separate, separate worlds um, in, in comparison to the U.S., for example. Um, but... I think there's two uh, problems here. One is that they're receiving country contacts and the institutions of integration in that country, political, economic, and social, have to be there. So I don't think it's really a question of whether Turks or Muslims want to integrate. They also have to be given the opportunities to integrate, right? So there has to be the institutional, um, I guess, base for integrating um, migrants which doesn't exist, you're right, in most of these Eastern European countries, which is, I think, why um, there's going to be a critical moment there. Um, we're already hitting it now, exactly because they don't have the institutional basis for integration of mass inflows of migrants. And on the education question, who are these people? Um, you know, I, don't, I haven't looked at the latest numbers, if we have them, of the refugee registrations. What is their SES, for example, socioeconomic status? Um, what I've read, this is very anecdotal, um, is that many of the Syrian my, uh, refugees are actually very well educated. Um, but is, despite that, even if they were not, many of these countries need manual laborers. They don't necessarily need um, more skilled labor. They need both, right? There's shortages across all the labor sectors. Um, but I think you're right that you're, Eastern Europe may become a weak link because of what's happening there now. Alina, do you want to go back to the question uh, yes, that the gentleman asked about 
American um, well, actually, history. I, and uh, I think that's. I think this is much more to the point. Than okay. what I said. But I, but I wanted to address directly, but in a large idea. Because I'm not an expert on any of this. But it seems to me that's very psychological element here that you've been talking about in the background, which might be most clearly seen, exposed, and understand Russia's toolkit of influence, that is the use of media and so on. Mm -hmm. And when I say psychological, I mean attitudes and values and behaviors, you know, I mean patterns of behaviors, habits of behaviors. Is there any analysis, analytic effort in that kind of a direction to see what the inner goals of these leaders and regimes and even small groups are. I mean, to look at it that way might be uh, something that would reveal, uh, you know, some answers that would be kind of out of the box to the usual kind of things. Um, you know, uh, there are some studies uh, that were done a couple of years ago at this point. Uh, interviewing far-right activists, for example. So trying to get beyond this kind of aggregate level bird's eye view to understand what are the motivations of individuals. Um, part of my dissertation did this in Ukraine. So I did a lot of interviews with far-right activists in Ukraine to try to understand what are their motivations for joining far-right movements at, um, at that time. Um, you know, what you find actually, and much more than this sort of social psychological question, is that these individuals do not fit the stereotype we tend to have of far-right activists. You know, the skinhead, you know, wearing the boots and the military uniform type of thing, and the neo-fascist tattoos, etc. Um, in my own research, which was in Ukraine, not in the EU's uh, member state, but this um, also was corroborated in uh, was, um, David Art's study on far-right activists um, that he did, I think, in five European countries, uh, hundreds of interviews is that these people actually tend to be educated. Um, they're not more educated, they represent the population. Um, they don't enter these uh, movements necessarily out of ideological reasons, which is how we like to think about political participation. We like to think you hold a certain set of ideas. You know, you hate immigrants, so you go join a far right movement that's also anti-immigrant. That's actually often not how it works. Um, usually people enter these movements much like they enter other social movements through their own social and personal networks. And once they're there, they acquire the ideology of the movement. Um, so it is a, a slightly different dynamic. Um, you know, I, I don't know if that fully answers your question. I think on, uh, on the question of looking at leaders, social, psycho social psychological studies of leaders, I, I don't know how many studies I've seen of Mr. Putin, for example, trying to understand who is Mr. Putin, right? Um, the, a new one just came out. Uh, it's, it's sitting on my desk to read. Um, that's supposed to be actually very good. Um, uh, by Stephen Lee Myers, a New York Times journalist. Um, what are we really going to get out of this? So we might, maybe we can take a closer peek into the, the minds of these political leaders like Putin, like Orban, et cetera, to understand their personal biography. Uh, but the reality is that um, we have to first understand their policies and how we respond to those policies. And what they really think maybe doesn't matter so much, to be honest with you, um, because we'll never know. Uh, I'm not really saying that. I agree with you about that sort of thing. But uh, I'm saying in terms of trying to make a policy that reaches a larger population. For instance, I always hear from Europeans that they see the commissions of the European Union as being unelected right. and distant and so on. So it's democracy there's an deficit. institutional alienation yeah. from the people that are supposed to be supporting them. And uh, that's the kind of idea of psychology I'm talking about. It's a kind of political psychology. Yeah. Not a, I mean, it would be interesting if you could find what Putin's soul actions like. But, uh, <laughs> well, George W. I, Bush has seen it. I read it. New York Review <laughs> books that had a, a view of Putin that seemed to me very relevant about his being the only guy in the... Uh, KGB headquarters in uh, East Berlin right. or someplace, and he stood up to them in disorder, and also uh, Klaus Milty was here a month ago, mm -hmm. and he said one of the motivations of his nationalism is dignity. Yeah. They, you know, they feel, uh, those are psychological things that are very large, and I think are very obvious. You know, I don't think you have to 
you know, get Putin on the couch. Really find out. You know, what I actually think would be very interesting is to see, um, I'm not sure how you would do this, is to see a study of how Russian media uh, uses these kinds of narratives, particularly about dignity and mm-hmm. pride and national narratives, which they do, but I haven't seen a consistent study that tries to understand this. Well, how to respond to that? Yeah. What policies could the United States express that respond oh, I have, to? Oh, I have some ideas about that, but you know, bit. nobody's really doing it. Um, I've also, in my, in my current capacity, I work on this topic as well, this, um, the information war, uh, if you want to call it that. And how do we respond to that? How, how does the West respond to that, right? Um, because we've disinvested in things like VOA, Voice of America, Radio Free, Radio Liberty, uh, which, were, which were very powerful in, in Russian and their local languages. They were very powerful ways of transmitting information into the Soviet Union. And it reached people, you know. Um, it reached me when I was in the Soviet Union. Uh, by the time I was living there, I mean, I was, I was a child, but there was just mass cynicism in the late social, socialist period. And uh, many, many studies, I mean, many of us, some studies have written on this to describe this, uh, the cynicism of late socialism specifically. But nobody really believed in the great ideology of the system anymore, right? Um, but, and a lot of that, I think, really had to do with our uh, media infiltration into what was a closed environment. Um, at this point, I don't think the U.S. Uh, can compete with what Russia has built out as to be a massive state-sponsored media machine that operates in multiple languages across multiple countries. So no matter how much money we invest into VOA, it will never at this point be able to compete with what the Kremlin has done. Um, that's my view. So I think the answers must come in more creative ways. Because what the difference is between the Soviets and now is that we live in a very different media environment. Um, there's social media. Um, that can penetrate a great deal of the European population who are susceptible to Russia's information campaign. Um, a smaller sector of the Russian population, because the majority of Russians still get uh, most of their news from television. Um, but then we have to decide uh, who are we actually trying to reach. Yeah. It was the House of okay. America Activities Committee. It just collapsed huh. when people started making fun of it. Yeah. You know, Thank the UPs got up and started screaming, their commies are gone. And, and it just went out of business. Yeah. That's all we have time for. <laughs> it's Thank a good note to much. end on. <laughs> Thanks so much for your questions.